I don't know about you, but I'd really like to meet the guy he introduced. Um, the way I generally do this, I've pro can you guys hear me? You hear me all right? I've probably done 60, 65 of these talks. And the way I generally like to do it is I like to make it more of a conversation. I'll read a little bit, I'll talk a little bit, but then I want to open it up so that we have a discussion. And when I begin this talk, I usually begin it by saying something that's too clever by half. Let me stop for a second. As we get into the discussion, I have one rule, and it's only the only rule I've got. And the rule is nobody gets to call me Mr. McGraw. All right. The only time anybody ever calls me Mr. McGraw, they're trying to serve me with court papers. All right. It's just Seamus. Okay. But I usually start these talks by doing something, that, saying something that's, that's too clever by half. I will turn around and I will say that the USDA recommends that everybody in this room get 18 milligrams of iron every single day. But I'm willing to bet that 80% of you in this room have not gotten your 80 milligrams of, of, of iron. But you know what? I live almost entirely on coffee and cigarettes, so I'm not going to throw stones. And then you know what I do? I throw stones. I'll reach behind the podium, reach under the table, I'll pull out a bag full of stones, and I'll throw it into the middle of the floor. It lands with a crash. It's 18 pounds of coal. You know why I throw 18 pounds of coal on the floor? Anybody? It's close. It's because that's how much coal you're going to burn today. You personally. And you, and you, and me, and everybody you know. The per capita daily consumption of coal in the United States is 18 pounds. In order to get that 18 pounds of coal, they have to remove 16 times that much earth. Think about that. Somewhere in Appalachia, somewhere in Wyoming, digging a grave-sized hole for every man, woman, and child in the United States every single day. And to do what? To produce the single, dirtiest, deadliest, most destructive form of energy there is. It killed my great-grandfather in 1901. It was linked to the deaths of 34,000 people last year, worldwide. If we were having this discussion five years ago, that 18 pounds of coal would have been 19.64 pounds of coal. You may not realize it, but the United States has dramatically reduced its coal consumption. It has dramatically reduced its carbon output. It has reduced its carbon output by an amount equal to the total carbon output of a country the size of Great Britain, where the Industrial Revolution began. How have we done it? Well, we've done it in a couple of ways. The first is, we have made tremendous progress in terms of the deployment of renewables. I spent a good portion of the summer out in Oklahoma and Texas. Wind farms, as far as the eye can see. Also coal, our oil and gas, but wind farms. We have deployed renewable capacity in the last five years that is equal, actually exceeds, 
the total renewable output of a country, cutting edge country, like Germany. We've made remarkable strides, nowhere near enough. We've made significant strides in terms of energy efficiency, believe it or not, and continue to. One of the other ways we did it was the good old-fashioned way. We ran the economy off the cliff in 2008. You know, you want to you wanna reduce your carbon output, just send yourself into a recession or a near depression. It, it works every time. But we've been growing at about 2 3% a year and doing all right. And yet we've continued. We've continued to keep our edge. But if you want to know the single largest reason that we have managed to reduce our carbon output, the IEA, the EIA will tell you the same thing. It's our growing use of natural gas. But you know what? That's all taken place without any kind of real policy, certainly not from Congress, and really not much more than guidance from the White House, resisted at every step of the way. <laughs> it's all un unseen hand stuff. And the thing about the unseen hand is what the unseen hand giveth the unseen hand take it the way and it flips you the bird on the way out the door. Because that same IEA report last year that talked about how natural gas had helped us reduce our dependency on coal and reduce our carbon output also pointed out that by about now we'd start to lose that advantage. I bring this up not to make a point to turn around and say gas is a good thing. It's to say this. It's to say that anyone who tells you, anyone who tells you that these shale reserves underneath my farm, underneath my neighbor's farm, elsewhere in the country, elsewhere in the world can be released without significant environmental risk, without potential harm. Anyone who tells you that this can and will be done safely and can guarantee it is either misinformed or is intentionally misinforming you. But anyone who tells you that there is not great possible good that can come from this if it's used correctly, if it's tightly regulated, is doing exactly the same thing. <sighs> when I first started doing these talks, I was up in um, Ithaca, New York, at a little bookstore outside of Cornell. And um, for those of you who've been following the issue, let me jump back for a second. I'm presuming here that you guys all know what I'm talking about. And that may be wrong. Can anybody here tell me what fracking is? Anybody? Okay, that's, that's, horizontal, that's the horizontal drilling aspect of it. You do that. In, in the case on our property, for example, they drill down a mile and out a mile. But there's another step. Yeah. When I ask people to define hydraulic fracturing, they will tell me that it usually consists of drilling down 
a mile, a mile and a half into the earth, straight down, a mile, a mile and a half out, then turning around and blasting down at tremendously high pressure, 9,650 pounds per square inch, a mixture of sand, water, and chemicals, to fracture the rock and release the gas that's inside. That's what people who are reasonably knowledgeable tell me fracturing is. And I will tell them they're almost right. They're almost right. What it actually is, is drilling down a mile into the earth, a mile across, blasting down a tremendous high, tremendously high pressure, a mixture of sand, water, and in some cases very toxic chemicals, to exacerbate existing fractures in the rock and release the gas. To exploit existing fractures in the gas and exploit, or in the rock and exploit the gas. And I argue, folks, that what's happening a mile and a half below the surface is in many respects a mirror image of what's happening on the surface in communities like mine, where people with very stark agendas that often have very little to do with the interest necessarily of energy, often have very little to do with even the interest necessarily of the environment, and certainly often have very little to do with the interests of the people on the ground. Come in with great fanfare, great support, financially and politically, to exploit the existing fractures in these already wounded communities. That, more than anything else, is what the end of country is about. It needn't be that way. It needn't be that way. And in the end of country, I introduce the readers to a couple of folks who give me great cause for optimism. When I read from my copy of the book, when I sign other people's copies of the book, I always sign it the same way. I always sign it with the, word, with the phrase, the only thing that's black and white in this book are the letters on the page. But I have a signed copy of my book. Mine is signed by a couple of people. One of them is a professor by the name of Terry Engelder, a professor at Penn State, the guy who first put the numbers on the Marcellus Shale and probably is as responsible as anyone else for the land rush and the ultimate development of the Marcellus. The other, Terry, I am proud to call a friend. The other, is a woman by the name of Victoria Schweitzer. I'm going to introduce you to Victoria now. Victoria is a woman who has shown the most amazing courage, the most amazing character, in turning around and fighting with every ounce of her being to hold irresponsible drillers to account. She is not only my friend, she's also one of my heroes. I'm going to introduce you to Victoria because I think Victoria and her relationship with a guy by the name of Ken Ely kind of cast in very stark relief the cultural divisions that are being exploited over this issue and how those fractures, if you listen closely, how those fractures in that community ripple through 
so many other aspects of our lives. This is where Victoria comes in. Like most newcomers to the country, Jim and Victoria had been enthralled by the ambient song of solitude, the gentle babbling of the tiny brook at the edge of their property, the insistent hum of a hundred thousand insects, the call and response of hawks and sparrows, the wind rustling through the ancient hemlocks, the call of an owl far off in the woods. It reminded Victoria the night she had spent at her grandmother's place, lying on the grass with her siblings, watching the stars twinkling above her and listening to the sounds of the living dark forest. But there are other sounds in the country, too, the harsh mechanical sounds of people trying to get by in a place where you have to fight the land itself for everything you have. It's the angry howl of a chainsaw chewing through downed trees so somebody can stock up enough firewood to keep the house warm for the winter. The bitter protest of a lumber truck or a rock truck or a milk truck engine braking so that it can make it safely down some precipitous side road one hill over. Or the guttural growl of a tractor with a 30-year-old muffler hauling a spreader full of oozing manure down the road. That's the moment when newcomers to the country learn for the first time what cow shit really smells like. And then one morning over coffee, they heard it, a sound that set their teeth on edge, rolling straight down the hill toward them from Ken Ely's place. It was a nightmare in the cool light of morning. It was every obnoxious industrial sound the region could offer, and then some. The shriek of the chainsaw, the coughing and sputtering of, a, of an engine in a backhoe well past its prime. Worse still, there was the bizarre animalistic shriek of steel on cold stone. It echoed through the trailer and through Jim and Victoria's skulls. Worst of all, there was the blasting. Fortunately, it wasn't an everyday occurrence, and it wasn't as if they could do anything about it anyway. The law said Ken had the right to blow up his rocks, and Ken was going to blow up his rocks, though the law also required that Ken hire someone to do the actual blasting, a condition to which he reluctantly submitted. For Jim and Victoria and their German shepherd, that meant that there was nothing to be done but listen for the periodic sounding of the air horn, warning that the blasting was about to begin, grab the nearest solid surface, and hang on. Her neighbors had advised her against challenging the old quarryman directly. He wasn't the type to take the admonishments of strangers kindly, and she tried to take their advice. Really, she had tried. The problem was she was constitutionally incapable of stopping herself, she admitted. Maybe it was her father's legacy. As a kid back in Falls, the little town along the, the Susquehanna River, right between the rugged hollows of the endless mountains and the burned-out coal fields of the Wyoming Valley, she had watched her old man with unabashed admiration as he took on the big boys, the local, county, and state government, and big business to block the construction of a power plant that he was convinced would further poison the already wounded river. He's a tough little guy, she used to say, and she had always been proud of him for winning that fight. And when she became a history teacher, she had chosen to teach a few miles south of Dimmick and Tunkhannock, partly so she could be close to the mountains she had come to love. She always tried to infuse her lessons with a little bit of the individual versus the corporate state complex message she had learned from her father. She had to admit that it had sometimes proven a little difficult to squeeze a morality tale about the zoologist Diane Fossey's brutal murder into her regular lesson plan, and she did raise a few eyebrows around the administration office when she got one of her classes to adopt, virtually of course, a mountain gorilla in Fossey's honor. The teacher in her, however, couldn't resist the temptation to take Ken Ely to school. It didn't happen right away. Whenever she got a chance, she'd grab her dog and head off on a hike along the top of the ridge, and she'd peer over the chest-high stone wall that marked the boundary of Ken Ely's land, hoping to catch sight of him. But Ken Ely was a, an elusive and wily man. In the first few months she had lived there, she had seen him only once, and then from a distance when he came roaring through the woods on a rattle-trap ATV decked out in camouflage. As she later put it, she could have sworn she heard banjo music. For the longest time after that, she'd half try to catch him stalking up to the rock wall whenever she suspected that he might be at work there, but each time she got there, he had vanished. 
It was unnerving, she told me. In fact, she said she often had the feeling as she and her dog walked along her side of the stone wall that someone or something, maybe a deer, maybe a bear, maybe even one of those long god catamounts that still turn up from time to time in the imagination of the locals, was watching her. As it turned out, she was right. One day, she caught sight of something moving through the woods, and then it emerged hesitantly at first, a clownish blue tick coonhound with friendly questioning eyes, grinning goofily and wagging its tail tentatively as it approached her, cocking its head, pleading to be petted. She had made contact with Kenny Lee's dog. It was only a matter of time until she faced the man himself. And then, one afternoon, a short time later, while Victoria and her dog were hiking along near the top of the ridge, there they were, Ken and his dog, not far from the stone hedge that marked the end of her land. This might be her only chance to make him understand, you know, you're killing the land, she blurted out as the coon hound slowly skulked away. Ken remained silent. He just stood there glaring at her with what she would later come to learn was the patented Ken Ely scowl that most of his neighbors and all of his grandchildren had long since learned to ignore. She screwed up her courage and kept on talking. His rock quarrying was more than just an aggravation to his neighbors, she explained, though it was destroying the pastoral silence she had been fantasizing about ever since she was a child. It was an assault on the pristine beauty of the place. The way she saw it, his quarry was a cancer on the land, though even she grimaced when she used that phrase, thinking maybe it was just a bit over the top. Still, the school teacher in her couldn't pass up an opportunity to educate the quarryman, and if he took it badly, well, that was unfortunate, but he'd just have to get over it. Ken Ely, of course, saw things very differently. The way he told it, it wasn't Victoria's bluntness that irked him in that first encounter as much as it was her attitude. She seemed typical of a breed of newcomer, people who act like they know the place because they can name the little villages that dot the highway, places so small you'd need a magnifying glass to find them on a map. They always seemed to be looking down their noses at people like him. But as hard as he tried to ignore his new neighbor, there was something about her that had just gotten under his skin. It wasn't that she hadn't grown up in these hills and didn't understand what he and the others who lived there did, that what a man does on his own land is his own business. It was that she did live here now, and somehow that made her think that she had a vote on what he did with his land, or at least the right to state her opinion, and that was what Ken couldn't abide. As he put it to me, she didn't seem to understand that this isn't some vacation spot, some pristine corner of the wild that could be pressed into the pages of a book like an old corsage. The land was all Ken and most of his neighbors had. In the past, people like Ken had taken from it whatever their abilities and the particular limitations of their own land would allow, corn, milk, timber, stones, and if that wasn't enough, and it usually wasn't, they'd take a little more. But for most, the days when you could make a living farming the land and maybe timbering it a bit were over. The farms were largely gone. And that meant that you could either carve up the cadaver of the land and sell off small chunks to folks like Victoria, or you could carve out what you needed and measure it out in tons. Ken had chosen the latter. Still, he never took more than the land was willing, however grudgingly, to give. And the land was more resilient than people like Victoria realized. You could tear it up with plows and bury it under mountains of fertilizer. You could hack down its trees and blast out its rock with dynamite. You could ship the shards of rock down to the valley where rich people would use them to put facades on their McMansions or build little stone walls to evoke that fake country charm so prized these days. But the minute you stop plowing, or digging, or blasting, the land would start to come back. Sure, you could kill it if you were greedy or careless enough. You could dig too deep, take too many trees, poison the land or the water with fertilizer. But if you did that, you knew you'd have nothing left at all. The way Ken Ely saw it, the land he owned didn't owe him a fortune, it owed him a living and not necessarily an easy one. 
In return for every dollar's worth of stone the land yielded, it was due a gallon of sweat, plus a few pounds of aching muscle and a few feet of creaking bone. But if, in Ken's calculus, the land owed him next to nothing, he owed everything to the land. He owed it his hard work, his constant attention, and most of all, his respect. And it was on that question of respect that he and Victoria most diverged. To him, people who only visit the country from time to time or who never visit it at all and only occasionally imagine it as a world wholly separate from their own, respect for the land often means leaving it untouched. To such people, it all boils down to one word, preservation. It's an admirable idea, one that has been embraced by some of the great heroes of American history and has led to the creation of Yosemite and Yellowstone National Parks, among other treasures. But to people like Ken, respect for the land means something else entirely. It means understanding in a visceral way that the land can be an ally, it can be an adversary, and sometimes it is both at the same time, but always. Its fate and yours are linked. And so you push the land as hard as you can, and when you think it's just about ready to start pushing back, you let it rest. You move to the next quarry, the next stand of hardwoods, the next pasture, and if need be, you nurture it back to health. You seed, you plant, and what you harvest is up to you. Do that, and the land will always come back. That was Ken's guiding principle. There's a word for that, too. Conservation. It's stunning how often the words preservation and conservation are used interchangeably in casual conversation. It's especially striking when you realize how different their meanings actually are. Ken and his jury-rigged backhoe were different, even if he didn't care about the land, and he did, passionately, though he was never one to show his passions publicly. Ken's little operation could never do that kind of damage. I understood that. We both knew the land as a resource and a refuge, a place that, as the old saying goes, had been rowed hard and put away wet. I couldn't help but remember the old Groucho Marx line about Doris Day, I knew her before she was a virgin. That was Ken's relationship to the rocky ground, and it was, in many respects, mine too. While Ken had wisely held his tongue during his first encounter with Victoria, he wasn't entirely silent. The way he wryly remembered it, it wasn't long afterward that he got his chance to, to offer a rebuttal, and it consisted of simply standing his ground. He had finished prying and scraping and dragging out every loose rock he could find in that part of the quarry, and now it was time to bring in the big guns, enough dynamite placed just deep enough into the fractures and the rock to blast free a new load, and he called in some local guys to do the job. Ken watched as the contractors pulled back a safe distance and then listened for the air horn to sound. An instant later, the ground shook and a massive bone-rattling roar rolled up and down toward the rusted old trailer at the bottom of the hill like an invisible wave. The bark of a purebred German shepherd told him that he'd let Victoria know that he wasn't going to change his ways just because she told him to. Within the next couple of months, both Ken and Victoria became allies in holding to account a driller that had, I believe, they believe, and the state DEP believes, had recklessly, at very least carelessly, created serious problems of methane contamination in the area. The rest of their struggle is detailed in this book. But the idea that people as different as these two could overcome their differences is to me one of the most hopeful things I've ever seen. Their fight continues. Ken, those of you who read the book will understand why. 
isn't in the fight anymore. But Victoria still is. Now, a few moments ago, I mentioned that um, I had been up in Ithaca. And for those of you who've been following the issue of fracking at all, you know that there are two centers of gravity in the, fra in the, the, the debate over hydraulic fracturing. If Penn State is the capital, to some degree, of the pro-drilling sentiment, certainly in the state of Pennsylvania, Cornell is its op opposite number. And I was up in uh, Cornell and doing a talk. I stepped outside to have dinner and smoke a cigarette. And as I stepped outside, a car came by. And the car had a bumper sticker. And the bumper sticker said, fracking is immoral. Now, setting aside the low-hanging fruit, the obvious irony of putting a statement like that on a petroleum product bumper sticker, <clears throat> I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. My first reaction was envy. Utter envy. I envied that kind of moral certainty. I envied that kind of moral certainty. I don't have it about anything, but certainly not about this. And I'm going to introduce you to somebody who might shed some light on my deep-seated moral ambiguity. Of all our neighbors, no one more clearly embodied the pressures that the local farmers were under to sign than Rosemary Greenwood. A warm and friendly woman, she had immediately invited me into her house when I showed up unannounced and made me a cup of coffee. She would have offered me something more substantial, like a homemade muffin, but she told me her oven had broken months before and she couldn't afford to replace it. There was no secret why she had signed on. Everybody knew it had been a, tough couple of, a, a rough couple of years for her. She had been widowed two years earlier, even though her husband had smoked three packs of Pall Malls every day of his adult life as he struggled from before dawn to after dark to keep the farm his family had tended for three generations from going under. It was ultimately colon cancer that killed him. Looking at Rosemary, it would have been hard to imagine that she could be from anywhere else. Though well into her 60s, and though the years of struggle had lined her face, she was still light in an almost girlish way, and in her barn boots and loose-fitting bargain store sweats, she seemed perfectly at home scampering up the slippery ladder of a silo or tossing hay from a mow. But the truth was, to Rosemary Greenwood, farming was a kind of indentured servitude. As one of her neighbors once put it, dairy farming is a lot like being in prison, except in prison you don't have to get up twice a day and milk the cows. <laughs> farming wasn't really in her blood. Rosemary had been born and bred in the valley, down in the coal mining town of Taylor, south of Scranton, and probably never would have set foot on a farm if she hadn't been swept off her feet four decades earlier by a good-looking farm boy who had come down to a local dance in the valley. The next thing she knew, she was a bride, and the next thing she knew after that, she was cutting hay and milking cows and pitching insulage, chopped corn cobs and stalks from the top of a 50-foot silo. And then, in the fall of 2002, her husband started to weaken. Rosemary had promised him on his deathbed that she would uh, try to keep the farm going, and that's what he had wanted, and that's what her eldest son, Todd, wanted too, and for a while, they were able to make a go of it. But within three years of her, of her husband's death, things were starting to become desperate. That too was linked in no small part to the price of oil. 
See, in the spring of 2005, as a result of a complex federal pricing structure that had been in place since the Great Depression, Rosemary was getting about $11.40 for every 100 pound of milk, regardless of what it cost a consumer on the shelf. That worked out to about $1 per gallon of milk produced at a time when the national average cost of a gallon of milk was about $2.32. Back then, it cost her about $0.26 cents to produce that gallon of milk. But energy prices were spiking, and so were Rosemary's cost. The cost of diesel for the Ford tractor was going up. They were now spending a few hundred dollars a week just to keep it running. Nobody could afford to run a tractor for long at those prices, she told me, and the cost of feed for their 72 head of Holstein was going up too. That was also linked to the cost of fuel, more than 60% of which was then imported into the United States. The federal government estimates that fuel accounts for about 40% of the cost of growing corn. And that does not take into account the hidden energy cost as more and more corn is diverted from the great national food machine to be used as the feedstock for the energy intensive alchemy required to create ethanol and other biofuels. It had gotten to the point that grain alone cost Rosemary and her son $3,500 every 12 days. And the price of seed corn was already starting its climb from $3 to $8 a bushel. It was only a matter of time. She knew until for the first time in her life, she'd be in debt to the feed store. But what choice did she have? Energy costs were taking a 30% bite out of the farm's gross revenues, and that was just in terms of operating expenses. Like everybody else in America, she had to live. And living in a rural community like Dimmick meant that she had to drive long distances, sometimes 40 miles or more, to get to a shopping center or make a doctor's appointment. And that meant buying ever costlier gasoline to fill the tank of the gas-chugging SUV she needed just to navigate these back roads during the snowy northeastern Pennsylvania winters or to slog through the actual deep Pennsylvania mud in spring. The narrow profit margins that the farm had relied on had never been enough to put aside enough cash to adequately insulate the 150-year-old farmhouse she lived in. And it was now costing her $100 a month to buy the oil to heat the place. That, too, was going up. Everybody else on the dairy farm food chain could factor all those costs into their price, and they did. While the price of a gallon of milk on American store shelves was fast approaching $4, Farmers were still getting a buck. And unlike the big corporate farmers who could use economies of scale to guarantee their profits, many, like Rosemary, were falling behind. Most of the other farmers on the road from Dimmick had seen the writing on the wall after the first fuel crisis, the Arab oil embargo of 1973, or the second one, the Iranian hostage crisis in 1979, or the third one, the run-up to the first Gulf War in 1991, just like Cleo Teal, they had thrown in the towel. Some had retired, some had found other jobs, though those were getting harder to come by. As the farmers went under, at least in part because of the cost of fuel, so did the companies that had relied on them. Local mills that for a hundred years had ground the corn that the farmers grew into grain had gone belly up. Local dairies that processed the milk had gone out of business too. There were other costs as well. Costs that are harder to factor into ledger books. These are the hidden price we pay, we, we pay to try to keep those foreign energy sources flowing, those intangible costs we don't speak of generally when we draw a line between the price of a gallon of gas and the price of a gallon of milk. Costs that are calculated not in dollars, but in lives. See, in places like Susquehanna County, when jobs get scarce, so do the young people who used to live there. Those who can leave do, and those young men and women who don't have the resources to move away have to find some way of getting by. In the spring of 2005, the local paper had run a story about how 59 young men and women from Susquehanna and the two adjacent counties, all attached to the National Guard unit in nearby New Milford, had just shipped out to Iraq. A lot of people in Susquehanna County lingered a little longer over the news pages that day before turning to the coupons. So it was no surprise that when the West Virginian and the white pickup truck showed up at her place at the end of 2005, Rosemary Greenwood was only too happy to invite him inside. 
to her the $6,400 he was offering for a five-year lease on her 256 acres of land was a godsend. It wasn't a fortune. There probably wouldn't even be enough left over after she paid her property tax to settle the bill at the feed store, let alone replace the old electric stove in the kitchen. The oven had given up the ghost not long after her husband had, and ever since, Rosemary had been living on canned soup, hot dogs, and anything else she could heat up on the top burners. But it was enough money to keep them going for maybe another year. And if it turned out that there really was gas down there, there could be a lot more money. You wouldn't even have to milk your cows anymore, the West Virginian had told her. You could just turn them out and let them go. She liked the sound of that. Rosemary inked her name at the bottom of the contract. Any folks know who Aubrey McClendon is? Ever hear of Aubrey McClendon? Aubrey McClendon, until last year, when he was driven out in scandal, was not just the founder, but the CEO of Chesapeake Energy, one of the largest drilling companies in the world certainly the largest than in the Marcellus Shale. Aubrey is nobody's idea of a liberal. Keep him in mind. To give you an idea of who Aubrey is, you guys remember the Swift Boat Veterans for Troop? For those of you who are too young to remember, in the 2004 election, George W. Bush, who had served in the National Guard during the Vietnam War, was facing John Kerry, who regardless of what else you might think of his politics, had been a decorated war hero, having served on a swift boat in the Vietnam War. And so it became politically advantageous to turn that against him. It's actually become a verb now. To swift boat someone is to take their strength and use it against them. Keep that in mind. I mentioned those 59 kids from Susquehanna, Wayne, and Bradford counties. About the time the first well in Dimmick came through, eight of those kids were killed on a roadside bomb in Fallujah. I happened to be talking to Mr. McClendon, and I mentioned those kids. And you know what he said to me? And this is a quote. He said, well, I'm not going to tell you that that was a war for oil. But I will tell you that if there wasn't oil, there wouldn't have been a war there. So maybe you can understand how when I step out to smoke a cigarette in Ithaca, New York, and I see a car come by with a bumper sticker that says, fracking is immoral. Maybe you can understand why a big piece of me envies that kind of moral certainty and wishes to hell that I had it. But maybe you can understand a little of why I don't. That's what I got, folks. Let's talk. Let's talk. We can talk about anything. Any questions about fracking? Any questions about energy? Any questions about writing? As I said, we are, doing, we are making tremendous progress. 
We are making tremendous progress in terms of deploying renewables. And yes, there is a cost. There is a cost to any form of energy that we use. There is an environmental cost, there is an economic cost. But there are also economic advantages that come from it, not the least of which, okay, is the development. And here's one of the things that's interesting. Because we tend to break along our, our, our traditional fractures, I'm going to go big picture here for you a second, all right? The reality is Pennsylvania, over the last five years, you will hear people who are partisan on the issue make the argument that the idea that any fuel in a more traditional sense could be used as a bridge fuel, as arguably gas has, has been pitched as, um, doesn't make sense that ultimately it will subvert the development of renewables. That may be true. That may be true, but so far we have seen no indication of it. Because if you look at the states where the greatest growth in wind power, solar power, has taken place, it's been in those states that are also producing fossil fuels. Why? Why? Pennsylvania is a perfect example. It's not just infrastructure. Infrastructure is part of the issue. The other thing is that right now we don't have the storage capacity. We don't have the ability to store the resources that we, uh, the, the energy that we generate in renewables at the scale that we need to do it. And so I have a situation where not far from my home is a town called Waymart. And Waymart has a massive uh, wind farm on top of it. We've gone to, uh, in the last literally seven years, we've deployed, uh, I think we've, we've increased, I think we now produce, I think it's seven million on our way to nine megawatts on this stuff. And if I drive past that, wind farm, about 40% of the time, I will see less than half of the turbines turning. Why? No, it's not that there's no wind, okay? It's that we are still, despite our riches in gas in Pennsylvania, which is I use advisedly, um, still largely dependent on coal. You can't ramp a coal plant up and down quickly. And so because you can't supplement the wind, you can't smooth it out with the system that we have, we end up not using it. There are only a couple of forms of energy that can move up and down quickly enough to accommodate for those fluctuations in wind, those differences in sunlight. At the moment, they are natural gas and nuclear. So unless we actually start using it, we aren't able to maximize. Now, the reality is I talked earlier about the advantages that we've got. When I throw that 18 pounds of coal on the floor, you know how much that 18 pounds of coal costs? How much your daily consumption? The bag I usually throw didn't cost me a thing because they couldn't figure out how to charge me for so little of it. But on average, it costs about $2 per day. Okay. The reason natural gas was able to eat that, the reason natural gas was able to eat into that was because we had so much of it that we had suddenly turned around and dumped on the market and the price went down. When we originally signed the contract at our place, gas was $16 a thousand cubic feet. By the time they drilled the first well on our place, 
it was two dollars and forty six cents a thousand cubic feet. It has to be low in order to be competitive with coal. And right now, we're about to shoot ourselves in the foot, folks. We're about to shoot ourselves in the foot. The issue, what's going on in the Ukraine at the moment, has turned the attention once again to the issue of not just the Ukraine, but Western Europe's dependence on natural gas. And so what are we going to do? Well, all of our drillers here, they want to turn around and ship that stuff overseas. All right? right now, we don't have the ability to do it. Okay? But we're moving in that direction. They want to ship that stuff overseas. You can understand why they want to do it. They can get eight, nine, ten dollars They can get it to Japan. They can get 14 to $16. As opposed to four and a quarter right now here. Problem is, once you do that, you've globalized the commodity. And once you globalize the commodity, once the commodity, once you start trading natural gas the way you trade oil, folks notice that oil, you know, when we went into Iraq, oil was $30 a barrel. Yesterday, oil went down to 102. When you globalize the commodity, you lose whatever advantage you have. So all of the negative consequences that come from drilling this stuff, and they are real, and they are profound, and they should not be minimized. Many of them may be mechanical. There may be solutions to them. But there has to be an incentive. And you know what? If the business, if you've gotten to the point where your business is export, if you've gotten to the point where you've globalized that commodity and it's not four and a quarter, okay, and still sort of competitive with coal, but it's $8.50, $9, and no longer competitive with coal, you've lost whatever environmental benefits you might accru accrue from this, and you've got nothing but the environmental consequences. And this is something that I, I, I worry about a great deal. This is something that I worry about a great deal. It's addressable. It's addressable. But the problem is, we can't begin to address it the way we have the conversation now. Our conversation consists of, I, I always put it this way, you got one side of the argument that doesn't want to admit that there's a problem, and you got the other side of the argument that doesn't want to admit that there can be a solution. You don't get anything done when you've got that. You know what? The problem is, is that they have a tendency. And if you talk to the CEOs, they'll tell you this. They're dealing with boards that don't look beyond next quarter. Mm -hmm. So you may, have, you may have CEOs who take the long-term view that you're taking, okay, in terms of long-term profit, long-term profitability. But it's very hard for them to sell it to their boards. Boards are also looking at the stock price. You know what? That's all their boards are looking at. Their, board, their boards are generally made up of guys who don't know the first damn thing about gas. Right. They, uh, but they know that the, their stock price goes up mm -hmm. whenever anybody says, we found a new customer. There's no question about it. You know, how many of you had heard of Dimmick before I brought it up tonight? Okay, Dimmick had become kind of ground zero for this debate in a lot of ways because of sort of the, the reckless behavior of a particular company there, Cabot. One of the things, this, this, this kind of might shed some light into why what happens happens. Okay. Most of those leases, do you guys know how natural gas companies or oil companies are valued? They're not valued on the market by what they produce. They're valued by their reserves. They're proven, probable, and possible reserves. So you can ask yourself legitimately the question of why would a company be reckless in a place like Dimmick, in places where you've had these methane contamination issues? Okay, let's, let's set aside the surface spills, let's set aside the other, let's, let's talk about methane contamination. Why would they be so reckless? Here's one of the things that's fascinating about the Dimmick situation. <coughs> 
The wells that were linked to contamination in Dimmick were not the horizontal wells that we're talking about here. They were vertical wells. Vertical wells don't produce anywhere near as much natural gas. They were drilled very quickly. Why? When were they drilled? They were drilled in 2007 and 2008. What else happened in 2007 and 2008? The crash. These guys overnight, overnight, saw that not only gas prices plummet from highs of 16 plus to two and change, but they saw their stock value absolutely crash. Aubrey McClendon, who I mentioned, personally, not Chesapeake, Aubrey McClendon personally lost $2 billion in one day on a margin call. Not enough. Not enough. <laughs> These guys stood around for about two weeks like ducks in thunder. Not a clue. But drillers have one response to every crisis. Raise a vein and stick it in. These wells were not never meant as production wells. These were exploratory wells. These wells were drilled fast, perhaps a bit recklessly, in order to turn around and drive up their proven and po probable reserve numbers. And it worked. It worked. And so the fact that to this day, they're still dealing with some consequences of that is a cost of doing business. I think that gives you some insight into the way they approach all of these things. Okay? They weren't looking long term. They were looking for the immediate fix. When it comes to the idea of these LNG terminals, they're not looking long term. They're looking for the immediate fix. If the strongest argument in favor of the development of natural gas is the argument that it has given us not just a domestic reserve, but a domestic reserve that has allowed us to escape the worst consequences in the short run of our carbon addiction and build a fuel to the future. If that's the best argument, and there are a lot of people who tell you that it is, why is it that when the gas companies line up, they line up on the side of those who turn around and say, there is no climate problem? They are working against their own best interests, and they do it all the time because it's always short-term goal. You sit down and you talk to the CEOs of these companies. In general, they will tell you that they recognize it, but they don't know what to do about it. They're MBAs, not engineers. Right. Right. They're not even MBAs. They're brokers. <laughs> They're brokers. So you've got that situation. But I am actually far more optimistic than I might sound right now. And I'll tell you why. I told you about that wind farm in Waymart. Waymart is a mountain ridge. There's a historic paradigm for us rising to the challenge that we face. Waymart is a mountain ridge. It's on top of what they call the Music Mountains that separates the Lackawanna Valley from a little place called Honesdale, Pennsylvania. 
Honesdale is a place that's very near and dear to me. And if you ever go to Honesdale, it's this beautiful 19th century town, river town, canal town. You can find the Catholic cemetery. There's a depression at the beginning of the Catholic cemetery that used to be the foundation of a house. And in the foundation of that house is buried my great grandfather, my great grandmother, and my uncle. Okay, that was their house. Okay, I have deep, deep connections to that place. Two of my, my, my great great uncles were canalmen, okay, going back. And what used to happen there was that they would bring, by gravity railroad, up from the goods and material, up from the Lackawanna Valley, over the Music Mountains. This is in the days before steam, okay, they would bring it down the Music Mountain, load it on barges, and ship it to New York city and to Philadelphia, where that stuff would be fashioned into manufactured goods. Well, what were they moving over the mountains? They were moving coal. They were moving iron. They were moving timber. They were moving the raw materials of the railroad. They were moving the raw materials of their own obsolescence. The very first locomotive to operate in the United States was called the Sturbridge Lion. It chugged a half mile down the main drag of Honesdale, Pennsylvania to the amusement of the rich canal owners as a kind of toy. Less than a generation later, it had rendered them completely obsolete. I find hope in that. Does that answer your question? If you're going to, if you're going to talk to these people, if we understand that they're motivated by profit, you have to turn around and make it in their interest. You have to show them that they can make money with it. The problem is, is that we don't tend to have that conversation this way. This is what the CEOs will tell you. It's also necessity. They will, the CEOs will tell you, okay, you want to regulate them more tightly? You want to get them to shift? You want to get them to you? I'll give you an example. <clears throat> you do it through taxes. Two years ago, Aubrey McClendon made all kinds of headlines when he stood up in Philadelphia and he turned around and he called opponents of natural gas Luddites who wanted to drive us back to the dark ages. And everybody on both sides of the issue was like, that's all they wanted to talk about. What they didn't hear was that the then chairman of, of Range Resources stood up at that same meeting in front of the Republican lawmakers and Republican governor of the state of Pennsylvania and said, tax us, regulate us. Why? Because he understood that in order to make the transition that he needed to make to make profit, he, un needed, he understood that, that he needed to be able to sell it to his board. And the way you sell it to your board is by selling it as part of the bottom line. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. You talk about <clears throat> methane contamination going through our existing water tables in many cases and releasing methane and in some cases other chemicals. Most of the spills that we've encountered in the state of Pennsylvania have, have surface spills um, have not been related to fracking fluid, they've been related to diesel and I'll get to that in a moment. Okay? But you want to turn around and get them to do that. All right? You want to turn around and make sure that they have turned around and, and gone above and beyond. So what you do is Talked about Rosemary Greenwood. You know what? Chesapeake, Range, all the drillers. And that poor farmer I was telling you about have in common. You know what they have in common? Neither one of them sets the price for their own commodity. So you know what you do? You turn around and you say, I am going to tax you within an inch of your life. To borrow a line from the movie, There Will Be Blood, I'm going to drink your milkshake. I'm going to tax you at 8%. But you turn around and you, you use that new cement and those triple casings. And you turn around and you show me this technology that you claim you've got. 
that will turn around and protect these water supplies, I'll knock you down a point. Okay? I mentioned a moment ago that the, the greatest number of spills we have in the state of Pennsylvania are diesel spills. One of the things that's interesting about this is for all the talk that the industry, the lip service the industry pays to how much, uh, how, how, how natural gas is going to bring us to a new generation of, you know, it's going to be the bridge and all of this, they still use diesel to get this stuff. All right. I remember being out at a rig in southwestern Pennsylvania, and I'm having this conversation with this buddy of mine from Range, and he's telling me all the wonderful things about natural gas can do, all the great things. I can just barely hear the son of a bitch over the roar of the diesel engine uh, running, running the rig, over the roar of the trucks at the side, over the generator. I can just barely, he finally takes pity on me. He turns around and he says, let's drive back to the office. The office is three and a half miles from the rig. The office is three and a half. We start back the three and a half miles in his big Ford Exploder. We get maybe a half mile away. The guy looks down at the gas gauge and starts white knuckling the steering wheel. All right. He looks at me. He says, so help me God. He says, I don't think we're going to have enough gas to get back. The irony is lost on the guy. Here we are sitting on top of the third largest energy field in the world. And this guy doesn't know whether he's going to have enough gasoline to make it the three miles to his office. Why? Because they don't see beyond the next quarter. Energy, oil, oil adds $800,000 to the three to six million dollars it costs to drill every single well. They could save that by turning around and using natural gas to get natural gas. There's no incentive to do it. I'll go even a step further. You guys may not know this, but Pennsylvania has the second highest number of rail miles of any state in the Union. Only Texas has more. And it all loops around in a giant horseshoe uh, around the state of Pennsylvania from one rust decaying rust belt city to the next, from Pittsburgh to Altoona, up through Norristown, up through Hazleton, Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, all the way up to Carbondale. Most of those places are within 20 miles as the crow flies from active Marcellus drilling fields. And yet we move everything, all the material, all the personnel, we move it all by truck. If you were to turn around and use that rail to transport that stuff, not only would you turn around and save these guys a great deal of money? Not only would you turn around and dramatically reduce the, the, the amount of particulate and carbon pollution that you're generating, but you would also be turning around and creating within each of these communities, decaying Rust Belt cities, the potential for economic redevelopment. I'll take it a step further. The, uh, the rail industry will tell you that they can move a ton of freight 500 miles on a single gallon of fuel. Right now, that single gallon of fuel is diesel. What it does is basically the diesel runs a motor which basically runs a generator. There's absolutely no reason that couldn't run on natural gas. One of the few things we still make in the damn state are locomotives. But we're not doing it. Those locomotives work on natural gas? They could. Absolutely. Any diesel engine could run. Any any di any diesel engine could run on LNG. You start doing that. You turn around and every one of those steps along the line. You turn around to your driller. You turn around and you say, you know what? You do this, I knock you down a point. You do this, I knock you down a point. I do you do this, I knock you down a point. You start working, okay, to turn around and develop on a reasonable time scale your natural gas to support the use of these turbines at 100% and you're moving in that direction. You're moving in that direction. And if this sounds like pie in the sky liberal nonsense, you know, look, I admit it, I'm a good old fashioned, you know, I'm a good old fashioned dyed in the wool lefty. That's why I wear the Tom Joad hat. But I will tell you, okay, I will tell you that this didn't come from me. This came from some of those CEOs 
This is what they meant when they stood up and said, tax us, regulate us. But the problem is, is that we live, it, again, it goes back to that issue. You can't solve a problem when you got one side denying that there's a problem and the other side denying that there's a solution. And that issue of using taxes, using the levers of government, that is the fault line. That is the fracture. That is the cultural divide that is being exploited. Do you know of a politician who understands both sides? Because politicians are there to make the compromise. A dirty word today. No, you know what? I, there, it is not a dirty word to me. It is not a dirty word to me. The essence of politics. But I know some who need to be encouraged. I know some who need to be encouraged. Frankly, I think to a very great extent, if you listen to everything that Bloomberg said on the issue of gas, there are areas where he was very critical. There were also areas where he has been, he has been funding you know, research that he doesn't know how it's going to turn out. You know, he's not asking the question like a lawyer. He's asking the question like a businessman in some of these cases, including the funding of you know, one of the other big issues we have with this, one of the big problems with natural gas. And it is not necessarily a problem that is answerable by turning around and coming up with any decision whatsoever on fracking, per se. When natural gas is burned, it burns 50% cleaner than coal, 30% cleaner than oil. When it's not burned, though far shorter lived, it is a terrible greenhouse gas. The only thing that's worse is water. Um, the thing is that, again, you know, you have the industry will tell you that they can reduce somewhere between 85% and 90% the amount of emissions that they're losing at the wellhead. And that's why we don't have any idea at this stage of the game how much we're losing. We don't have any idea. We have a bunch of different studies that tell us a bunch of different things. There may be some outliers, but you know what? If you stop drilling today, if you stop drilling today, we still would be generating what we've drilled over the last hundred years and are still piping through that you guys are still cooking with here. It's still leaking. And so here you have an opportunity to fix the problem. Here you have an opportunity to revisit the infrastructure, but only if there's an incentive. And if one side of the issue is turning around and saying, there's no problem, and the other side of the issue is saying, I will go along with nothing that has to do with natural gas because I ultimately dream of the day when I will be fossil free, as do we all, we don't get anywhere. We do not, under any circumstances, need as many wells as you could possibly drill. It is not even in the short-term interest of the industry to drill as many wells as they could possibly drill. Okay? Yes, you could be talking, you are probably much more likely talking about something under 100,000 wells under the, over the lifetime of this because of the economics of it. All right? The reality is, the question is, where do those wells go? The question is, where do those wells go? There are certain areas that right now are up for grabs that absolutely should not be under any circumstances, including some movement to turn around and drill in, in public lands, including state forests. Now, I object to drilling in state forests for a number of reasons. Um, not all of them. Um, ones that my, 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 my environmentalist friends adhere to. For example, the forests are not a preserve. They're a resource. They're a resource that was set aside to be developed. Okay, it was to be set aside to be developed for timbering, for sustainable development. And if you turn around and allow drilling in there, you disrupt that. And you end up costing yourself more than you're going to get out of it. That said, we, see, we hear the same argument when we, when we talk about the tar sands. You will hear people who turn around and say, you know, if we burn everything in the tar sands, it's game over for climate. And that's absolutely true. But you will hear compelling arguments from guys like Mike Levy who I have a great deal of respect for, who turn around and point out that it's almost impossible for us to burn it all. Mike, Mike Levy from the Council of Foreign Relations, Michael Levy. Um, in fact, if you get a chance, he's got a great book called Power Surge, um, which is a tremendous book on this subject. And he goes into great detail about how, um, 
how it is virtually impossible for us to exploit it completely, simply because of the economics of it. So yes, there is a risk that we're going to have a hell of a lot more wealth as we speak. Okay, um, they are in the process of drilling, they're permitting two more wells on my property, which will bring it to four. All right. Understand that you're now, and I've had to ride these guys tooth and nail. I've had to ride these guys on everything. No question about it. I've had to ride them constantly. But understand something else. They are exploiting an energy resource that covers two square miles, having disrupted and severely disrupted five acres of my land. Everything is a trade-off. Everything has a, has a cost. I want to throw something else out here, too. For those of you who haven't read the book, I, it, I talk about this. We did allow them, after much soul-searching, frankly, to drill on our, on our farm. And I was talking at the University of Indiana, and uh, they had invited me because they knew the book, or suppose I, I told them. Somebody turned around and said, well, you should issue a disclaimer at the beginning of your talk that, that, that you allowed. And I said, I did issue a disclaimer. It's 345 pages, and it's published by Random House. It's, it's a whole book about why we allowed it to happen and some of our, our deep reservations about having done it. But the question can be legitimately asked, and I think it should be legitimately asked of anybody who stands up and talks to you about this subject. To what extent does the fact that I made the decision I made influence what I'm telling you now? And I gotta be perfectly honest with you. I am sure it does, but I'm not sure how. I'm not sure how. I'm not sure how it influences what I say. I mean, the reality is if, if there are two things that would be very much in my interest. One of them would be exporting natural gas. That would be in my personal interest. Right. I'd make a fortune. A okay. Partner. Right. Absolutely. I, I get 25, 15, 15 percent. Okay. Uh, my family gets 15% of what comes out of the ground. They do this. In euros. All right. Uh, mm -hmm. That'll be worth something. <laughs> I mean, but you know, you know what? A moratorium. You know, it calls for a moratorium. A moratorium would benefit me financially. Benefit me financially. I oppose both export and moratorium. So I'm sure it influences me somehow. I'm just not sure how. Yeah. Look, you, there is no, th th you make an important point, a very important point. The reality is, you know, we're not going to turn it off. We're not going to turn it off. And, 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 you know, you're hitting a, a really important point. The reality is we cannot at this moment, and probably not for another 20 years assuming that we make the kind of progress we anticipate making, are we going to be able to sufficiently reduce our dependence on fossil fuel and replace it with renewables? What we can do is make tremendous progress in terms of conservation, in terms of reducing the amount of fuels that we use. But the reality is we're not going to stop this. And you know what? We're not going to stop the drilling either. We're not going to stop the drilling either. I'm, I know I'm getting a little countrified here, but I'm going to tell you guys a story. Okay. When I was a kid, our first horse was a Palomino named Sundance. My mother had named it. Okay. I think because she had a crush on Robert Redford. In, in, but in any event, it was this <clears throat> beautiful, beautiful horse. He was a stag. Do any of you guys know what a stag is when you're talking about a horse? A stag is a horse, well, I got one person who knows. A stag is a horse who is castrated late enough in life that it doesn't do anything other than piss him off. <laughs> it doesn't do anything to make him any more compliant. It just makes him really resentful of the species that did it to him. And so this horse 
what he used to do was he used to run away with you. He didn't buck like some of the other horses we had. He wouldn't roll over like this mare that I had, but he would break into a dead run, and he had a, he had a, a, a dead mount. And I'm all of about maybe 11, 12 years old. Now, my father, grown up in Scranton, never sat a horse in his life, used to get me up every Sunday morning, and I would have to get on this horse. And I would get on the horse, and as soon as I got on that horse, that horse would break into a run, and he would scrape me off on the nearest apple tree, and I would be down there just bruised and bloody and sobbing. And it happened every Sunday. Every Sunday. My father would, I got to the point where I dreaded Sundays. I mean, I would lie in bed Saturday night with my, my lower intestines just turning to hot water, you know, just terrified of the idea that I was going to have to get on this, this horse. And much better riders than I had tried to, to break this horse. None of us could. None of us could. And it got to the, I, 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 I was just, I would literally, I was terrified. And every Sunday I would come back torn up and battered and bloody and sobbing. And finally, after about a year of this, my father took pity on me. Or maybe he was just disgusted with me. But in any event, he decided that he was going to sell the horse. So he called up our, our horse guy, a guy named Buddy Baldwin, whose wife had the best name I've ever heard for a horsewoman. Her name, so help me God, was Winnie. And they came up to get the horse. Okay. And I don't know. 12, 13, maybe it was the bravado that kicked in. But I see Buddy standing there. He's this old cowboy. I see Buddy standing there. I see Winnie standing there. I said, let me try it one more time. And we saddle up Sundance, and I hop on Sundance. And sure enough, he takes off. And I'm pulling back on the reins, and I'm sobbing, and I'm trying to stop him, and nothing's happening. And something inside me snapped. I don't know what it was, but something inside me just snapped, and I dug my heels into that son of a bitch, and I started to whip him with the reins, and I screamed like a banshee, and when he tried to stop, I wouldn't let him stop. And I kept digging my, and he, I ran him, and I ran him, and I must have run him about a mile and a half. I ran him all the way down to, 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 to the Williams place. I turned around and ran him all the way back. I get to the bottom of our, our, our hill. I pull back on the reins, and he stops. I kick him. I ride him up a little further, I pull back on the reins, and I stop. Let the reins go. I ride up to my father and buddy standing on top of the hill, pull the horse up, stop, hop off the horse as proud as you can imagine. This 13-year-old, 12, 13-year-old kid, I hand the reins to my father, I go, there, and now you can sell the son of a bitch. <laughs> I see in that story the metaphor for how we have to deal with this. You are not going to stop this. What you have to do is what I was talking about before. Use the industry's instincts to achieve the goals that you need to achieve. I think you have one significant difference. When I plant corn, when I cut hay, when I run cows in a field, I can change my mind. Once I've committed myself to that five-acre hole in my property, I'm, my, mother, my, my mother calls it the slag heap. She calls it a column dump, which is what they used to call the, the dumps of, of coal. Eventually, it will be reclaimed. But in the short term, I'm committed to this course of action in a way that I would not be in terms of agriculture. But you do hit another interesting point, which is the idea of commodity, commoditizing these things. You know, when you talk about any of those crops, be they livestock or crops, you know, those two are held hostage to a global market. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You talk about exporting uh, natural gas. Doesn't it have to be liquefied first? Yeah, yeah. And that's the, that's the thing. At the moment, we don't have the capacity to do it, but we are in the process of doing that. There has been a tremendous move. I, I believe I've lost this. I've made this argument everywhere I go against it, and I believe I've lost it. At the time that I wrote the book, we had two 
facilities that could liquefy natural gas and export them. And one of them was designated specifically to export gas that we had, to re-export gas that we had imported back before the, the shale boom, when we thought we were going to run out of gas. Um, now there's a tremendous move afoot um, to turn around and do it. We've got, we're talking about Georgia, we're talking about Philadelphia, we're talking about here in the, in, in, in the metropolitan area, you're talking about Boston, you're talking about on the West Coast. There's a tremendous move afoot to, to push this thing. So you're right, we don't have the resources now. At the time that I wrote the book, there's a line in the book where I talk about the fact that 25% of the well on my property, is, and this is another reason why exporting it is bone stupid, folks, because the reality is that 25% uh, of the, well, the wells on my property are owned by Statoil Hydro. Okay? Um, if you were to go up to Dimmick right now, a significant number of the, uh, of the, the workers um, working on rigs there because of the partnership are from Mongolia. Okay? Um, the reality is at the moment we can't export the gas. Statoil didn't buy the gas. It'd be like walking into a pizza place and, and saying, I'd like to buy 25 million slices of pizza, and the guy says, fine, but you got to eat them here. Um, it's that sort of situation. They're not buying the gas. They're buying the technology. They're buying the technology so that they can turn around and develop their own shale resources. And the reality is, by the time we finally get these LNG facilities done, what we will have succeeded in doing is driving down the price in Europe, driving down the price in Asia, and driving up the price here. It's a lose, lose, lose from an economic standpoint for everybody involved.